and we will move on to the rest of the session. I'll stop sharing my screen for a moment at least. Make sure I've got my window set up correctly. And say hello again. Welcome everybody to this third of three um, skill up sessions on uh, building lessons with the carpentry's workbench. Uh, this is the this is the the opportunity that Gian and I have both been waiting for to run the session together. I'm very excited to do so. Um, before we get into the session, I'll go through a few logistics. First of all, I'll tell you what you can expect from this session. Broadly speaking, the um, the structure is going to be I'll do a bit of introduction to um, set the scene and to get a bit of information from you all about how much you already know related to the carpentry's lesson infrastructure and the kinds of things you're interested in finding out by the end of this session. And then I'll hand it over to Gian, who's going to um, give you a, a short talk um, about the kind of history and the motivation for developing the carpentry's workbench. And then we'll take a break. And when we come back, we'll have a look at a sort of guided tour of a lesson website using, that's using the workbench and the repository that's um, that serves as the source, I guess, for that for that lesson website. And we'll have a little activity at the end as well for you all to get a chance to um, get some experience with some of the features that we'll be talking about in the rest of the session. Um, I think that the next thing that's appropriate to do is to give Xi'an a chance to introduce himself, and then I'll start asking you all some questions. So Xi'an, go ahead, please. Hello. Um, if you all don't know me, uh, my name is Xi'an Kambar. I'm the Lesson Infrastructure Technology Developer at the Carpentries. Um, I spent the last few years building the workbench, and um, I, uh, I'm just happy to uh, show you all what it's about and how it's going to improve the um, the workflow experience for uh, lesson contributors and lesson maintainers um, and uh, instructors and learners. And just, um, I should have just said, everyone who works at the lesson. Um, uh, it's a vast improvement over self and you'll see that. Um, and I'm here to also hear what you think about it. and. Um, answer your questions. Um, and I'm just really happy to be here um, working with Toby on this. So thank you. And um, also, uh, I would like to direct everybody to uh, the Code EMD document, um, specifically the 12 August 1400 UTC section, in which I would ask you to uh, please sign in. Um, and Toby uh, can give you a uh, an introduction on how to do that. So take it away, Toby. Yeah, thanks, Gian. That's great. Um, so if you follow the Code EMD link, you'll either be taken straight to the kind of editing interface of that, or you'll be taken to the more static version. And just in case you were taken to the more static version of the page, I'll start there, show you how you can get to the editing interface. The the sort of what we what we refer to as the rendered version of the code emd looks something like this it's a um it's quite a long document containing notes from previous sessions but if you if you see what's happening here for example someone's writing their details into the sign in section and that's starting to appear on the page now we can't click here and start typing into the page um in this view of the document instead what you need to do is use these buttons near the top left of the window. Um, this one with the little icon of an eye is the viewing mode. This one with the pencil is the editing mode. And to show you how the two look together, the one in the middle is this kind of split screen mode that shows you the, the rendered version of the document on the right hand side and on the left hand side, the, um, the source text of the document. And if you scroll down to line um, 33, that's where you'll find the um, sign-in area for this session. 
And you should be able to, if you're in this split screen mode and working on the left-hand side of the screen, or if you're in the fully editing mode, you should then be able to type into this document. And whoever is adding new empty bullet points, you're my favorite person. Thank you very much. Um, so please have a go at writing into this document by adding your details um, into this list. One of the things that you might notice while you're doing this is that all of these lines that start with a um, that start with a minus symbol and a space become bullet points in a list in the rendered version. And that's because this code EMD document takes um, or is able to interpret um, text that we're writing in the editing mode as markdown and then display a sort of formatted version of the text based on the um, markdown that it's interpreting. Markdown is a um, relatively lightweight um, language for marking up text, which is to say you can use symbols in certain combinations to tell the, um, the, the software that will interpret this markdown how you want the text to be displayed in a, in a rendered version of that text. So in this case, we would put minus symbols in a space at the beginning of a line that we want to appear as a bullet point in a list. Um, but you could also, for example, um, write bold text between two asterisks. And you'll see that in the uh, rendered version of the page, it shows up, this text then shows up in bold. If you want to learn more about how to write things in Markdown, then the best advice I can give you while working with this page is to click on this little help icon, the question mark symbol um, near the top left. And if you click on that, then you'll get this handy pop up with a, um, with a guide for, for a lot of the Markdown syntax, showing you what you would need to type in Markdown for it to show up. Um, like so in the rendered version. But I hope that for today, at least, you're going to get all of the markdown that you need from sort of the context of the, of the code EMD that we've set up already. Um, you can see, for example, these lines like line 33 are headers, uh, are headings within the document. And the level of that heading is set by the number of these hash symbols, or I think some people refer to them as pound symbols um, at the beginning of the line. So we've got three here followed by a space, and that tells the Markdown interpreter that this text with the date and time of today's session should be a third level heading within the document. Oh uh, yeah, they're also known as octothorps. Thank you, Gian. I always forget that word. Um, and what I'd like you to do after you've um, finished signing in, is scroll on down to line 160. It's a long way down now. Um, from line 160, you're going to find three questions that we want to ask you at the beginning of this session. So what I'd like you to do is put a X or some symbol, some single character next to whichever answer um, best describes your experience. So have you written any markdown before? Yes or no. Have you used code EMD before? Yes or no. And how familiar are you with the current lesson template? So that's the one that um, is maintained at github.com slash uh, carpentries slash styles. And you've got three options there. You can say that you're not at all familiar, that you're somewhat familiar, or that you're very familiar with it. That will help guide us in terms of um, how much we need to provide context or um, to compare things between the, the old template and the, and the new infrastructure. Um, and I hope it will also guide all of you, particularly the folks who've got more experience with the current template. Um, please remember, it looks like there are 
quite a few people on this call who are not going to be as familiar with it as you are. So please keep that in mind when you ask questions that you might need to provide additional context for people to be able to understand um, what you're getting at. And we'll try to remember that as well. So thank you all for filling that in. I'll, I'll scroll back down and take a look at it again in a few minutes in case there's more people still to add their answers. So that was from line 160, in case you need the reminder. And then we're doing a bit of jumping around, I'm afraid, but from line 94 in the Code MD, there is a section where you can add your own um, questions for this session. So what I'm interested in knowing at this stage is what are you hoping to know by the end of this session, I guess? What questions do you already have about the Carpentries Workbench coming into this session that you're hoping we're going to answer by the end? Um, and I'm gonna give you all four minutes to write those in. Um, and then I'm probably not gonna address any of them now. Gian and I are probably not gonna address any of them now, but we're gonna refer back to them later. And if it seems like we're getting towards the end of the session and we've forgotten to refer back to them, then please feel free to interrupt us, to write something into the chat to remind us because otherwise, you know, we if we if it seems like we're skipping it, it's because we've genuinely forgotten and we would like you to remind us is the point I'm trying to make. Um, so I'll give you three more minutes to write those in and then I'll probably hand over to Jiang shortly afterwards. These questions are things that I'm glad you're asking um, because uh, I have answers for pretty much all of these. <laughs> um, so I'll get started in um, I'll get started in a minute. I'll let you finish up your questions. Okay, I'm seeing slow down in the question. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start um, presenting, uh, giving my um, uh, giving my presentation overview of what the workbench is and um, how it's how it's going to be. Uh, I'm going to give some um, uh, some context about how how it's uh, why we built it and how it's different from the uh, current. Uh, styles, um, I put template in quotes. It's not really a template. It's a tool set. Um, it's a box of tools that you bring home with you that you have to keep updating. Um, the workbench is not that. And I'm going to tell you why and how. Uh, so, uh, is everybody able to see my screen? 
go ahead and type in the chat if yes or just um, thumbs up. Ah, I see thumbs up. Good. Cool. Um, okay, so uh, as I've already introduced, I, my name is uh, Jian Kambar, joined by a doctor, Toby Hodges. Um, and we're going to talk about building lessons with the Carpentries Workbench. And a few of you have already expressed that you're wondering, what is the workbench? Why is the workbench? How is the workbench? Who is the workbench? I, yeah, I know. <laughs> so, um, and we have to acknowledge the fact that uh, this has been, this is a project that's been uh, in the making for a couple of years, um, for quite a few years, actually. Um, but quite a few years in terms of the minds of people who have been with the Carpentries for a while, um, such as uh, Francois Michonneau, um, has been uh, has been thinking about uh, how to transition away from um, Styles workflow um, to a better workflow for uh, maintainers and contributors. Um, but uh, the Carpentries curriculum team has been um, essential in um, really helping to uh, give valuable feedback on the new features of the workbench um, and uh, feed, uh, a historical perspective. Um, in, and this also includes the Carpentries community in general. Um, a lot of people, um, some of the people on this call have helped out with um, testing out the, uh, some of the features of the workbench um, to make sure that they're stable. They've gone through alpha testing and we're about to go through beta testing, which we have some people on this call who have um, volunteered for that, which will happen um, in the coming months. We just need to uh, reorganize. Um, also, funding support from member organizations, the Sloan Foundation, Mozilla, CZI, and Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Um, so we want um, to kind of give you a perspective of our lessons. And the, the fact is, our all of our lessons um, have a wide audience. Um, and this includes, um, this is not just maintainers, but it's uh, also instructors or and um, learners who and others who want to use the content independently. And I have run into so many people who tell me that, um, yeah, I use the Carpentries material all the time in my courses. Sorry for stealing it. And I just say, no, don't be, don't apologize because it's not stealing. You're using it under the Creative Commons license that we have there. So these lessons are widely used. And um, the thing about these lessons is they're open source. This is why people can use them for their own material. People fork these lessons, change the data set, they change things that they that they like, they add things that they want, they take things out that they don't want, and they use it. Um, and these are all uh, written in a flavor of Markdown called um, Cramdown, which is the Markdown that uh, a static byte generator uh, called Jekyll uses. And we use Jekyll because um, it was the easiest way for people to contribute to Mark, uh, contribute to lessons to create a website on GitHub um, at the time. Um, because otherwise, the other solution would be uh, writing pure HTML. And if you've ever write, tried to write an entire document in pure HTML, um, you know there are often pitfalls because you may miss, you may miss a, um, a closing flash, and that would just make your document look kind of wonky. Um, so we thought, great. Markdown is the way to go. We're going to use Jekyll because that's how you, that's the entry point for using GitHub. And this, this template, these st this style template is built using a few, using a few steps. It has its roots in the software carpentry template, which has gone through many iterations over the years. So as I mentioned, it uses Jekyll to combine markdown content with HTML and CSS templates to create a static web page that is automatically hosted on GitHub pages. And this was chosen because it was the most likely path for scientists to set up their first blog on GitHub. It uses Python scripts on the back end to validate and set up lesson content, and it uses make and bash scripts to orchestrate building, testing, and deployment of the lesson. 
And with the exception of Jekyll, this uses all the tools we teach. So, because we teach Python, we teach Bash, and we teach Make. That's great, right? That means that anyone who's been through our lessons can build a website, right? Not quite. Um, while there are a lot of people who love to use the template for their content, the number of languages required to build a simple markdown based lesson is intimidating for a lot of people. Uh, in fact, in 2020, uh, we have, we put together a video that describes the process to preview your lesson content by forking the lesson on GitHub so that you don't have to install Jekyll if you don't want to. And I'm not particularly proud to say this, but in, because we act openly, um, until mid 2021, I did not have a sufficiently working version of Jekyll on my machine because I know I could, I knew I could just use Docker, uh, to build my lesson. And that is not to say that I had not ever installed Jekyll before 2021. I had a working version of Jekyll and then I switched machines. Um, so it, it can be frustrating even for uh, experienced users. Another side to this problem is that our lessons, uh, the styles version was an all in one template. As I mentioned earlier, template is a misnomer because the lessons are built on top of the styles repository, which has all the styling and the tools embedded within the repository itself. And it meant that updating to a more current version of styles requires a maintainer or myself to synchronize the histories of the styles repository with the lesson repository and create one huge, often huge pull request. This pattern also means that we are often hosting lessons that are that are over a year out of date with our style. And this problem will only grow as we gain more lessons in, from the incubator. And there's also the problem of the fact that all of these issues are, are lead up to situations where maintainers are finding that they spend more time trying to debug a particular problem with Jekyll, Make, Python, or R instead of working on their lessons. And in short, uh, the lesson infrastructure has become a barrier to our, for our community. And when I say community, um, I really, I do mean community. Um, we have 168 lessons up to, as of the end of February. Um, there are just over 50 official lessons and the rest are uh, community developed lessons. So these are lessons that are actively going through uh, development. And if we take them if we take these, uh, if we take the struggles that I've just showed you about um, the style template, in light of the sheer number of lessons that we host, it's clear that the model is unsustainable. And moreover, considering the, the vast majority of lessons that are on the Carpenters Incubator, the lesson developers have so much more to consider uh, while working on a lesson that fighting with the infrastructure is not something, uh, is not something they should need to handle. Um, some of the things that we, that we have, uh, for example, is, uh, we have, we have different stages in which these lessons go through, in which these lessons are constantly being iterated over, massively being rewritten. Um, and we have, uh, official stages such as, um, open peer review, uh, for, uh, entry into the carpentry lab, uh, and this is a model that's based off of uh, the R Open Sci and JOS model, focusing on lesson design content and accessibility. Moreover, we partner with the Jour Journal of Open, Sci Open Source Education to publish papers about lessons that are accepted into the lab. And again, this means that everyone who's working in the incubator is doing a lot of work and they shouldn't have to worry about their infrastructure. So to solve these infrastructure issues, we, cre we present the Carpentries Workbench. And uh, it, contain it is a series of three R packages that separate out the orchestration, the styling, and the validation elements into external packages that people can use so that they don't have to worry about um, updating their repository to use the latest tooling. And I'm going to show you what that, uh, a little bit about what that looks like. Um, so it means that we go from lessons that look like this. 
the lessons that look something like this. And the main goal of the workbench is to clearly separate the content from the tools needed to render the content into a website so that contributors need to only focus on writing markdown or R markdown. Um, we can do both. Um, and that way, everything, everything is separated. There's an air gap between um, the rendered version and the source version. And that way, we don't have to worry and, and the tooling. So that way, maintainers, contributors only need to focus on markdown, which is the main point. If you want to work on a lesson, don't think about the tools. And the tools that we chose, I looked through, um, uh, I looked through all, uh, all manners of static site generators. And, um, I was trying to think about, you know, what tool is good for, it would be best for the community. Um, fun fact, there are over 400 static site generators out there in the world using like over like 20 different languages. Um, but ultimately, we instead of using Jekyll and a Makefile or Hugo or Eleven D or Gatsby, we don't talk about Gatsby. Um, the workbench uses R and Pandoc, and you're probably wondering why R? Why are you using a statistical language in order to build a website? Well, aside from the fact that um, R actually has a very robust publishing ecosystem. Um, it also has some of the friendliest and most welcoming communities you will find. Um, this is a, a quote tweet from uh, Janina um, that says, uh, some people laugh when I tell them that R's best feature as a language is its community, but I'm very serious, especially Our Ladies has been such a positive agent of change for so many people. And I think about that often. I think about the fact that R has really been, you know, I've been working with R for 10 years and throughout those 10 years, it has been a place where I know that I can ask questions that I may, I may think are silly, but other people answer with sincerity. And I've, I've asked questions on uh, Python forums. I've asked questions on Jekyll forums and I haven't gotten the same level of uh, kindness and respect that I get from R. And so this is just, uh, this is why we chose, we chose R as the base for this. Um, and, uh, for those of you who ask questions about, um, will we move, will we move over to, uh, Quarto in the future? Yes. Um, we are looking, uh, once we get the, once we get the lessons as they're currently are, um, released into the workbench, um, now we will explore, um, working with Quarto. It's still in kind of a molten state. Um, so, um, it's best to make sure that the, the, uh, on ramps are paved, um, when we get there. So, um, now that you know why we built it, um, you're probably wondering, okay, that's great. So what's, what's the diff? What's the big diff? Well, first of all, the folder structure, uh, of your repository will look a bit different. In many ways, it's simplified. As the folders containing the styling and the tools here in gray um, are ported out to the different packages. Um, so things like things that are in bin, that would be the um, that would be the validation script uh, and build scripts. Those would be ported out to sandpaper and pegboard. Um, things like includes layout assets. Um, those are uh, those are things that are those are the styling elements which live in varnish, which means that you can fork varnish and update like create your own styling. Everything in episodes, episodes and episodes RMD are combined into one folder, so that Markdown and R Markdown live in the same place. You don't have to separate them. Moreover, things that support episodes will live inside of the episodes folder. Extras are split out into uh, extras for learners and extras for instructors so that if you have a learner that's going to a website, you don't, uh, they can click on the extras tab and they don't have a cascade of like 10 links that they, they can follow, five of which they don't, they care about. We have a folder for, for instructor profiles and then a, a folder to hold the site locally 
if you build it locally. Moreover, images are going to look a bit different. And these are based off of Pandoc syntax, which makes room for captions inside of the square bracket. Uh, and the reason for this is uh, actually quite, uh, it's quite prescient. Uh, the caption can have markdown formatting. So if you want to write a caption under the image um, that will be included with the image, you can write it here. And then the alt text uh, gets included as an attribute, um, which means that you can also uh, you can also add other attributes uh, in the curly braces. Um, this follows Pandoc style formatting, um, which is a little different than uh, than the default Markdown formatting. But um, we have we will have reminders for that. Moreover, um, the syntax for block quotes uh, for our for our uh, callout block. Um, is going to be a little different. So instead of nested block quotes, we are going to surround these by uh, nested uh, surround these by senses, also known as sense div. Much like you would write code surrounded by fences by code fences, you can write div of these um, sections surrounded by fences, and it starts with at least three colons followed by a keyword then your markdown content, and then a series of at least three colons without, without the, the tag. And you can practice this inside of the code EMD. Inside of the code EMD document, you can actually see that we have some of these uh, embedded within the, within the document. Um, and also, one of the things I'm, I very much like is that we're getting rid of the confusing template language mark, markup. Um, so, for example, link uh, in which you want to link to another episode that's within the same folder, um, you no longer have to write this uh, confusing template markup in which you have to try and imagine where exactly it's going to live in the in the website. Um, you make a link that's relative to your current file. So, linking to another episode. You just type the name of the other episode and it will link. So that's what's changing, what's new. Um, the, the, in the workbench, I showed you the folders. We separate our materials for instructors from materials for learners. And uh, one major feature, uh, uh, one major feature of this is inline instructor notes. So in the styles repository, we have a few of uh, a, um, we have a separate file called guide right now uh, for instructor notes. Um, and often a lot of instructors don't even know it's there. So what we've done is we've allowed for instructors to communicate across space and time um, by adding instructor notes in line. So for example, here we have a section called mutate. Um, in which uh, there's some content and some code. But here's an instructor note at the beginning of the section saying, hey, um, while you're working for this example, um, you may not be able to see the weight column in a zoomed in R Studio screen. So if you include select um, at the end, then you'd be able to see it a lot better. And from a learner's perspective, they see the content as it is. They don't see the instructor note. So they don't have that um, they don't have that barrier. They don't have that. Um, there is a there's a specific word that I'm trying to think of. Cognitive load. They don't have that extra cognitive load uh, to handle. And when you switch to instructor view, you see a collapsible instructor note informing you about the things that you might not that you might need to be aware of in your lesson. Um, and this is this is a game changer. This may this means that you not only have the wisdom of the of the experienced instructors in your current workshop, you have the wisdom of instructors of past, of of days past. And these, that means that these can be updated. It also means that it's an it's an easier way for um, people to contribute to lessons. 
um, in a way that uh, in a way that doesn't that takes burden off of the maintainers because they don't have to worry about is this going to extend the length of the lesson? It won't. Moreover, um, in the workbench we set. Uh, in, moreover, in the workbench, um, we really want to make it easy for you to make your lesson accessible. Currently, in our lessons, um, not all of them have uh, alternative text um, for their uh, for your uh, images, and a lot of lessons will have links that just say here, which is not very not great for screen readers because. Um, uh, when you scan links, you just you just get a list of links that say here, 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 click here, click here, here. And um, in the workbench, when you build a lesson, before the lesson is even uh, is rendered to HTML, before it before the R markdown is rendered, um, pegboard comes the package pegboard comes in and it and it parses the markdown content and it says, hey, do we have alt text for our images and hey do we have informative um informative text for our link um and this makes it uh, this makes it easy for you to say hey i made a mistake and i need to add alt text for uh for my images i can go back and do that um and it it really leads you to a path for success um moreover um and this is a this is a preview this is a preview of uh, what you can see on GitHub if you have this and this will appear uh, for pull requests on GitHub. Moreover, um, we have pull request preview, um, and I don't mean the um, like the Netlify build uh, that you see on the Carpentries blog sometimes or in other blogs where you get a preview of your web page um, if the content is included. I'm talking about something a little bit more focused. Um, and this is specifically for our markdown lessons. Um, in the future, it will be for uh, lessons that use Quarto documents. Um, but imagine that you're writing an R lesson and someone makes a change to a pie chart. Um, and with style, uh, with the style template, you had two options. You could A, trust that it works, or you could be download it to your computer and test it out manually, assuming that you have the styles infrastructure um, installed. For pull requests in the re in in the workbench, a temporary version of the markdown will be rendered so that you can compare exactly what changed and how it changed. So you can have the source code, how it changed. And but you have the output of that source code temporarily, so you can spot if a pack a new package creates an error or problems or new output in some way that you have to address, or if um, or if someone tried to modify a code block that um, that suddenly produced a new warning that you didn't anticipate and need to um, need to address in either the prose or in the code itself. Um, and this is really powerful because imagine you're trying to edit a lesson while you're at a conference and your laptop, you don't have a charger for your laptop. Well, you can use anyone, you can use someone else's computer and do it uh, right here on your GitHub account, or you can even do this on your phone. Um, this is how, pow this is, uh, how powerful that is. Um, and so for the rest of the session after the break, what we're going to do is when, oh, no, for the rest of the session, um, we have about 15 minutes. Uh, I can answer your questions and then we're going to take a break, take a look at the uh, workbench lesson repository, and then we're going to have you try and contribute, contributing to a workbench lesson. Um, and yeah, so I'd be happy to answer any questions that you all have. Um, uh, Unless Toby has uh, another agenda, which I can't remember. So if you have any questions, please um, type them in the chat or um, raise your hand um, or put hand in the chat.
and I'd be happy to answer. Okay. Um, ah, here we are. Alicia has a question. For the instructor notes view, will be the will there be a limit on how many instructor notes get added, as that could make the actual lesson hard to follow? That's a good question. Um, at the moment, no. Um, and this is uh, the instructor view only differs from the learner view in that it has the instructor notes embedded, so you can switch between the views. Um, uh, easily. And I think this is one of the things that uh, the maintainers are going to be, uh, the maintainers are ultimately going to be the ones that are going to be controlling that. Um, so if they, if they see an instructor, um, if they see an instructor note that gets added that's related to another instructor note, they could, they could say, hey, please add to this instructor note or consider this instructor note in light of what you want to add and consider how that's going to affect the flow of the lesson. Um, but that's a very good question, Alicia. Thank you for asking that. Um, do you have a follow-up to that? No, that's, um, I forgot about the maintainers reviewing things, so that would make a lot of sense that, that they would keep track of that and make sure it doesn't get too out of hand. Yeah, yeah. And that's why the community is here. Um, the community is here just to make sure that um, everybody has a has a has a place to um, has a place to contribute, and that uh, the contributions are of quality. Uh, so Toby has a hand. Go ahead. I wanted to follow up on that uh, question about the instructor notes, and I think it's, it isn't a thing that we'd considered really. And for those of you who are familiar with the TV show The Wire from the early two thousands. Um, one of my favorite quotes from that show is that sounds like one of those good problems. And I, I just want to say that in this context, most of our lessons don't have a lot of instructor notes, certainly not instructor notes that are really specific to one particular part of the lesson. So I don't, certainly I don't anticipate that being a problem that we will face often soon. However, we are also, um, you might have noticed if you were paying close attention to all things Carpentry Con, that originally there were sprint sessions on the schedule to try to add instructor notes to our lessons. Um, and we canceled those sessions because we want to do that with lessons that are using the workbench so that we can make, we can take full advantage of this um, inline instructor notes feature. Um, so we will be running that kind of instructor note contribution drive, I guess, sometime uh, soon. So please keep a lookout for that. Um, and yeah, I guess one of the metrics we can have for success is uh, that now we need to figure out what to do about the problem of having too many instructor notes on any given page of a lesson. Thanks for the questions. Um, yeah, it isn't something that we've thought about before. Vini, you have a question, go ahead. Uh, yes, on that same line of questioning, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on the difference between the learners uh, and the instructors directory for the extras? Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, in reality, they all get built to the, they all get dumped into the same place. But it's um, what happens, uh, Toby will show you this um, during the, um, during the walkthrough of the lesson, um, but the learner, the uh, the content for the learners is content that's really going to be presented to the learners up front, um, and then the content for instructors uh, is it's not going to be uh, so readily available uh, to the learners. It's only going to be available in instructor view. So the headers going the headers going to change, um, and the extras drop down menu um, will change based on the view. So, for example, if you want to, when you have a glossary, that glossary will be available to the learners uh, front and center. Um, but if you want to have the, if you you have separate instructor notes for the broad lesson, 
um, those will be for instructors. Um, or like uh, the, I think for um, an example would be um, like if you have extra challenges that you want to um, make available to the instructors um, that they can give to their that they can give to their learners if they have extra time, that can go into the instructor notes. Um, or that can go into the instructor's um, uh, uh, folder. Um, and the learners can get uh, things like cheat sheets or like information on where to go next. So it's really it's really like giving you like giving you separate little boxes that you can um, separate things in more clearly. And is it just like a button that toggles the instructor or the learner view? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's oh, okay. a there's a button on the on the top right of the website. And Toby will okay. show you that after the break. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? And these questions have been really great so far. Thank you. And I will say there are a lot of features that I have not highlighted here. Um, I want to make sure to highlight a lot of the features that are um, really salient. There are some other features that um, that we will discuss later. And um, yeah, I think at this point, it might be a good time to uh, have that break um, so that people have a chance to stretch, um, or in my case, finish my breakfast. <laughs> Um, uh, what, what say you, Toby? Yeah, that sounds great to me. Um, I'd say we'll, let's aim to be back at, um, what, five minutes past. Does that sound good? Sounds good to me. All right. And, um, thanks everybody. And we'll see you in. 11 minutes, roughly. All right, folks, welcome back. Please, um, I guess, give us a thumbs up or something in Zoom to let us know that you're back so that we can get started again. You could write back into the chat if you wanted to, any indication that you're ready to get going again. Great. Okay, I see a few people. Putting thumbs up. Thank you. Um, so in the break, I um, well, it turns out that I have a something like a childcare emergency, meaning that there's a, a baby sleeping in the next room who could wake up at any time. <laughs> and when that happens, I'm going to need to be the one that goes in and helps him out. So um, I'm going to try to get through as much of this demo of the workbench as I can in a at a pace that is still understandable for all of you, but at some stage I will have to hand back over to Xi'an uh, for the rest of the session. So sorry about that, everybody. But um, well, that's the way live demos go, I suppose. So what we'll do with this next part is I'm going to take you on a kind of guided tour through a lesson website that is built using the Carpentries Workbench and then through the source repository on GitHub that that lesson website is being built from. Um, and we'll look at some of the features that Xi'an mentioned in his talk. And we'll look at what the kind of structure underlying that is and what the syntax is of a particular episode file, for example. Um, and then to cap all of that off, we'll give all of you a activity that you can try to do. Um, through GitHub to 
contribute to this lesson um, so that you can see some of those automated um, previews of, of changes to the rendered lesson pages that uh, Jian mentioned in his talk as well. And then I think we'll have time at the end still for, for more Q&A, at least to review that list of questions that you wrote at the beginning of the session to make sure that we've covered the things that we're able to cover within that list, which I think is, is almost everything in there. So this is, um, this is a workbench built version of the R ecology lesson, the data analysis and visualization in R for ecologists lesson from data carpentry. Um, and if you were to look through the names of the episodes, for example, they would hopefully be familiar to you if you've, um, if you've worked with this lesson yourself um, in the past. And I think the first thing that I want to point out to you is this drop down the top right here that says learn of you. If I click on that, then I can switch to instructor view. Now, before I do that, um, I'm going to ask you to take a look at what is here in the um, top menu next to the search bar. Um, yeah, Xi'an, thanks for sharing that in the chat. Actually, I should say um, in that section of the Code EMD, there's links to the repository and the lesson site. So you can take a look through yourself as well if you want to while you're following along with me. If I switch to the instructor view now, then you'll see that this top menu changes slightly. We still get the key, the kind of collection of key points from the um, from the lesson, but now we've got a link to the instructor notes and a link to extract all of the images from the um, from the lesson. That can be helpful. Um, extracting all of the images, I mean, um, can be helpful if you're preparing to teach a workshop to so that you can share only the figures from within um, a lesson as kind of visual aids while you're teaching a workshop without having to screen share the entire um, lesson website or the entire episode page that you're currently working on. That tends to involve a lot more scrolling and it tends to distract people um, by having all of the other text kind of around those images as well. And the other thing that changed when I switched from Learner View to Instructor View is the name of this landing page. Um, in Instructor View, it's Summary and Schedule. And if I scroll down through the quite long um, landing page for this lesson, there's a lot of information there. And past that, you'll find a table at the bottom of the page, which contains the, um, the schedule for the lesson. Now, when this lesson was converted to use the workbench, um, or I should say this the other way around. There have been changes to the workbench since this lesson was converted. And that means that the, um, uh, the piece of metadata for, for each individual episode that says, that describes how long that episode takes to teach, the syntax for that has changed for the workbench. And so now none of those times are being recognized in those, in those source files, which is unfortunate for this demonstration. But what you would see if those were, if those values had been updated um, is the kind of increased increasing time that it takes to teach the lesson. So these would be estimates of the um, of the time that it takes to teach um, the individual episodes. But yeah, we haven't updated that, and so it's not showing up here. I'm sorry about that. Um, something something I should have done before we started this session. Okay, but if I scroll back up and switch to switch back to Learner View um this landing page is summary and setup so it doesn't contain that schedule table which is really most useful as a guide for instructors to to give them an idea of how long they should be taking to teach each of this each of the sections or that's not that's not right they should take as much time as they need to take but an estimate of how much time it is going to take them to teach each of the sections um and instead, the learners are presented with the same kind of landing page information and then some setup instructions um, that are specific to this lesson. 
And if we um, head to one of the episodes, for an example, um, we'll look at this um, manipulating, analyzing, and exporting data tidyverse um, episode. I can collapse this sidebar to give more space to the um, to the episode content itself, and I can scroll down here, and and you get an idea for what the contents of an episode will look like. Now we've got these um, blocks of source code that are written in R, and then we've got out output blocks that show the output from some of these, these um, code chunks as well. And if I keep scrolling down, we should find a challenge and an expandable and collapsible solution box to go with it. Um, this is perhaps most interesting for the people who are familiar already with the with the old um, template and the old styling for, for lesson websites as a comparison. But what I want to particularly draw your attention to is um, this part with the mutate um, subheading, because in the instructor view, there'll be an instructor note in this part of the page. And we're in learner view at the moment, so we can't see it. Um, Xi'an has provided a link to this particular section of this particular episode in the in the chat. So feel free to follow to that if you want to. And the link that he's provided is in the instructor view. So if you do follow that, you should see the instructor note there. I'm gonna click this back to this handy back to top button on the right and switch to instructor view. And then I'm gonna scroll back down again to the mutate section. And now you see, while I'm in instructor View, I get this instructor note box um, kind of jumping out at me. And if I want to read that, then I expand it like I did with the solution box before. I can read the note that will give me some advice on how to kind of most effectively teach this section of the lesson. Um, yeah. But, but for a learner who's reading through this in, in learner view, then they wouldn't, they wouldn't see this and it's not really relevant to them. What else should I show about the lesson interface Xi'an before moving to the repository? I believe you've covered most things. Um, the all in one page is a good, is a good place to um, show people right now um you also right. have the back you also have the back to top um yeah scroll bar when you i should remember that <laughs> <laughs> so this is where you'll find the all-in-one page version of the lesson so following this link will take you to a very very long page that is all of the episodes concatenated together into a single um into a single web page but it allows you to control f and find things um, eventually, we will get the search um, to work. I just want to make sure that it's accessible and sustainable. Um, uh, cool. And, yeah. I'm going to switch to. I had a single, a single sorrowful cry from my son on the on the monitor, but I think he might still be asleep. So I'm going to try to keep going. Um, and I'm going to head to the source repository for this um, for this lesson. So I'm going to do that by scrolling to the bottom. There is no handy go to bottom button. So I will scroll all the way down and click on the source link here. Oh, uh, there's a question in the chat. Is there any way to toggle between instructor and learner view without scrolling to the top of the screen? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, changing the URL. Uh, changing the URL will allow you to do that. If you insert it, um, so the the link that I pasted in here. Um, if you if you take away the instructor uh, part of that link, it will allow you to go directly to the to the learner view. But that is a good point. Um, I will I will look into uh, ways of doing that. Thank you. All right. So if I click on this source link, 
it's going to take me to the GitHub repository for this workbench lesson. Um, and let's pop that URL into the chat now if you want to follow along. And so this is what the um, this is what the lesson repository looks like. It's um, still a fairly long list of um, folders and, and files, I suppose. But I hope that some of the names, at least, of the files and folders are more um, immediately meaningful to people, I guess, easier to kind of guess what's going to be within those folders, for example. I'll start off by talking through the folders that are here. This .github you might have seen in other repositories is, is full of things that are specific to GitHub. The episodes folder contains the files that, that the episode pages are built from. Um, IMG is for images, I guess, but I've got a feeling that that won't be, that wouldn't be there in a, in a more up-to-date version this of Workbench. Is, is that right, Gian? Oh. Yes, this is a specific, this is specifically Gian forgot to exclude that particular folder in the translation. Um, so there are quite a lot of things um, in here that um, we're still working on the translation. Um, and this lesson in particular is, it's wonky enough that, uh, or it was built in a very different way than the default lessons. So um, in some ways, this was not the right, I apologize for that. Um, well, but yeah, there we're are here some, now. Yeah, and there are some, and so there are some folders that don't belong, um, but yeah. Okay, I'll try to, um, so the instructors, and the learners folders contain the sort of extra pages that are relevant to the instructors and to the learners respectively. The profiles repository, uh, sorry, uh, directory would contain learner profiles for the lesson. Um, RNV, I guess, is associated with the R environment and site contains files that are about the site that's been built, I think. Um, Xi'an, please. Correct me if I'm wrong about any of these. The site is if you look at if you look at the site folder, there's there's a single README and it says ah. this directory contains rendered lesson materials. Please do not edit files here. Um, this is a directory that's uh, simply for um, what happens when you build the lesson locally. Um, that's where the lesson will uh, live. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, all of these files that begin with the dot are sort of configuration for various different things. And I don't think you are likely to need to play with those as a um, lesson developer or a maintainer most of the time. All of these files that are, whose names are in um, uppercase are kind of most relevant to the GitHub repository. There's a bit of overlap between the repository and the lesson site that's built from it. But in a lot of cases, these are um, relevant to the repository and to the um, sort of our project that the, the lesson is, I suppose. Um, the README, I guess you probably know about but is it acts like the landing page for the repository itself so you see in github a rendered nicely formatted version of that file um, underneath this table of the contents of the repository conduct contains the code of conduct contributing contains a guide for contributors that one you might want to update as a lesson developer or a maintainer i should add um, depending on what kinds of contributions you're looking for and any other kind of guidance that you want to provide to people who might come and contribute to your lesson. Um, let's keep going. Config.yaml is the one that I most wanted to point out. I'll follow that um, to show you this. This is a file that contains the, um, I guess, the global configuration for the lesson. So in here, you would set particular parameters that control how the lesson site as a whole looks. Uh, the carpentry field, for example, can be changed to have the lesson site styled as a um, software carpentry or a data carpentry or a library carpentry 
um, lesson site, or you can put, although it isn't documented in this version of the file, you can put incubator here as well and get it um, styled as a Carpentries incubator lesson, for example, as well. It's the title set here is where we set the, the life cycle stage, so you can indicate to people whether this is a lesson that's in alpha or beta, and so on. Um, and a few other things that you can set. I guess the most important one to point out of the remaining things here is that you should remember if you start using the workbench to put your contact details in in to here so that people can contact you if they've got questions about the lesson. Um, index.rmd is the, um, in this case, R markdown file, but you can also have index.md that is the markdown file that forms that landing page um, that I showed you before, the summary part of summary and setup or summary and schedule. Um, and then these R scripts at the end are specific to this lesson, I believe. I'm going to head to the episodes folder next to talk you through what's in there. So first of all, I think the fig um, folder is worth mentioning. In there, you'll find the um, source files for the images that are used as figures throughout the lesson. And then each of these .rmd files corresponds to one of those episodes in the, um, in the lesson with the exception of this one that starts with an underscore, which I think is providing the um, information about when the page was last built um, to give people an idea of how recently the lesson that they're looking at or the particular episode they're looking at has been updated. And I will note on that, um, that again, that is one thing that's an artifact of my building. I needed to, I need, I needed to exclude that, but I have not done so. The, um, the, uh, Sandpaper provides those, um, or the workbench provide, provides that information automatically. So um, that that was kind of a, uh, that particular file was a bit of a shim um, for, the, for the lesson developers of this particular lesson. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks, Jan. Um, and so now let's drill down further and look at the, um, the source of one of those particular episodes. And I'll, I think it's this one that is the source of the episode that we saw the instructor note in. And so if I open that RMD file, then you'll see a header at the top that is key value pairs, as, as Xi'an mentioned in the in the Zoom chat, um, that config.yaml is, is um, mostly one-to-one um, -one key value. Um, pairs. And here we've got the same um, setting the title for the episode and um, some text to put for who the authors were. Are um, this first code chunk? So, this is for anyone who isn't familiar with R Markdown, and I have to confess I'm not a particularly um, experienced R Markdown user myself, but this is a code chunk that appears kind of invisibly in the in the episode page that's produced um, but it's executed to kind of set up the environment for this particular episode to make sure that the data is loaded in and the um, variables that were created earlier in the lesson that are going to be used in this episode are available so that um, so that we don't have to repeat ourselves at the beginning of every episode redoing all of the steps to get to the point that we're supposed to be at now um, so you'll see this in the source but you won't see this in the in the um, final result of the episode page itself on the lesson there's an objectives block this is our first fenced div that we've encountered um, hopefully you'll remember that from the talk that Jian gave before it needs to be at least three colons here it's a lot more than that and then um, after at least one space after those colons we provide a um, a class, I guess, for, for what kind of fence div this is. In this case, it, we're saying that this is a list of the learning objectives for the episode. And then within that is the list of those learning objectives. And afterwards on line 29 is the closing fence for this fence div, um, which is another long string of colon symbols without the class identifier at the end. So um, colons followed by a word are opening fences, 
um, colons that are not followed by a word are closed sentences is, is um, the way that I remember it. Then there's more markdown and more R markdown, but I'm going to scroll through that fairly quickly because that's um, the same as as a typical um, R markdown document in the most part, and is also the same as the R markdown source files that you would have seen for um, for a lesson using the old template. Um, Here's a challenge block, the one that I, I pointed out earlier when we were looking at the, at the rendered lesson. This is opened with a fence followed by the word challenge. And then we've got the markdown of the challenge itself. Um, and then we get a second opening fence here for the solution class of fence here. And then we get two after the, the code chunk for the solution to the, um, to the exercise, we get two closing fences in a row right so this this string of um colons and this string of colons are both closing a fence to div and the way that this works is that um a closing fence closes whatever the most recently opened fence div was so this first closing fence closes the solution div and this second closing fence closes the challenge div. Um, so you have to think of this as kind of building up in, in layers. And then each time you add a closing fence, taking one of those layers off until you get to the bottom of the pile again. Um, and Jian has, um, I think, helpfully here demonstrated one of the kind of stylistic approaches that you can use to help you tell the difference between which of these closing uh, fences belongs to which of these opening fences by making sure that the, um, the closing fence here lines up with the end of the opening fence line. Um, I have seen in other um, contexts people taking an approach of starting with uh, three colons and then the next opening one would be six colons and so on to have them kind of growing outwards um, as well. So I think that's another approach you could take. And I, um, while I was talking through this in the first of these workshops, Xi'an, I was thinking it might be a good idea for us to write some kind of style guide or something to um, encourage people to adopt a, a standard for this. Um, okay, and if I scroll down a little further, you'll find the second level heading for that mutate um, section of this episode. And immediately underneath that, you'll see another fenced div here, this time of the instructor class. And this is that instructor note that we saw in the, um, in the lesson site before. So this is how you define one of those inline um, instructor notes that will appear somewhere in the, within the content of an episode page. Um, you write the the content of that instructor note within this these two fences and the workbench takes care of the rest, making sure that that will appear um, where it's supposed to in the in the lesson website. And my hope is that when we do this um, instructor notes contribution drive with the community, then we'll have lots of people writing lots of these fence divs um, in the not too distant future. Okay. Um, that was a fairly quick, I guess, rundown of the lesson site interface, the lesson repository structure, and the structure of a um, episode source file, at least for an R markdown um, source file. What questions do you have at this stage? And I guess to Xi'an, is there anything else that you particularly want me to show people at this stage? I think you've shown uh, most of what I want, what what uh, we should have shown. I think that's, um, yeah, I think we've done, I, I think, um, I do want to note that, um, again, this, like, uh, this particular lesson, um, if you want to know what a default lesson looks like, um, we have some exam, we have some templates that you can use. Um, and they are at um, the 
typing and talking is not one of my skill sets. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll um, find them too. It's okay. They're they're at the workbench um, homepage, um, which is located in that section that we link. But um, it we have our the workbench home homepage is really a link to a bunch of resources. So um, one of those resources are um, a set of templates uh, here. And I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen because it's a screen sharing party and we want you all to be involved. Um, <laughs> so uh, the Workbench Home uh, rec Resource Guide um, gives you information about the Workbench beta, um, then gives you some resources. Um, so we have official Workbench documentation guide, um, a lesson that uh, Toby has written, uh, Toby and uh, other community members have written called Collaborative lesson development training is currently in in beta, I believe. Um, uh, the tools for the lessons, um, and then templates uh, for an R markdown lesson, which I'm opening in a separate tab, and a markdown lesson template, which I'm opening in a separate tab. And if I go over to these templates, I'm going to tab over. Um, you can see that the folder structure is actually a bit simpler um, when you don't have the weight of history uh kind of pulling things down um the r markdown lesson for example had uh the only difference between the r markdown lesson and the markdown lesson is that an r markdown lesson will have an rm folder um whereas the markdown lesson does not have that and for those of you who know about r markdown um and r and rm um you don't know, have to know anything about rm in order to use the lesson um that's done automatically um yeah, and so you can use this template to create your own lesson if you wanted to. Um, and I can demonstrate that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, this, uh, this, this page is a good resource to go, uh, for if you want to, um, find resources about the workbench. You can, you can find, um, my write up about how the tools work, um, in the workbench, um, but you you don't need to read it. Uh, there's a, also a transition guide between um, Workbench and Styles, showing what the infrastructure looks like, um, local rendering, the folder structure, as you've seen, side-by-side um, -side comparison of block quotes, call-out blocks, um, and, uh, and also how we, um, if you really want to dig into things, how we release, go about releasing uh, the packages of the workbench uh, for use. And if you are all, at all interested, um, I would encourage you to um, go to uh, the GitHub discussion um, and introduce yourself. Um, and I'm going to be giving updates about the workbench on the GitHub discussion um, for the Carpentries workbench, um, which I see someone has already uh, introduce themselves there. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to uh, pause for any questions before I move on to the example in which uh, I'm going to show you um, how to make edits and pull requests to the um, um, to the workbench. Actually, I'm just going to move over to that page now. Um, seeing no questions, um, at least I don't see any on my screen. Um, I'm going to move over to the pull request workflow example. So the pull, one of the one of the advantages, as I said, is an automated workflow pull request. Um, so um, I'm going to make a, a what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a pull request, and then I'm going to walk you through um, the process of doing it um, of what happens. So I have a code block and it creates an, an illusion of a pyramid. I want to change the colors of this pyramid. Um, so um, I want to create a pull request. Um, and what I'm gonna, the way I'm gonna do that is I'm going to click on this little edit this page button. Um, this, is, this is still the learner view. So uh, any learner can do this. Um, instructors can also do this um, as well. So I'm gonna click on the edit this page button um, and 
it's going what it says is going to it says hey you're making changes in a project you don't have access to um, and the reason it's saying this is because I am using my Bizarro account. Um, uh, my Bizarro account is Kian Jambar, um, and Kian Jambar does not have access to this repository. So it created a new branch in my fork, um, and or it's going to create a new branch in my fork. Um, so I want to change the color of this uh, pyramid um, from not deep sky blue, but I'm going to change it to um, the color of the Oregon sky in 2020, fire brick. Um, and um, just so that, um, you know, the colors of the pyramid are not going to be so brilliant, um, I'm going to change it to uh, wheat and uh, wheat three. And notice, I don't, I'm not going to be able to run this code. Uh, on my computer because I'm editing on GitHub. Um, Fire Sky is my commit. Um, and I'm going to click on Propose Changes. And then I'm going to go ahead and look to make sure I did it right, create my pull request. Um, let's make it more realistic. Um, and I'm going to create my pull request. And what's going to happen is, um, on the back end, uh, Workbench is going to um, there's a there's a pull request workflow that checks to make sure that um, I'm not doing anything malicious uh, because there are GitHub workflows. It's checking to make sure hey no workflows have been modified and I'm not trying to spoof another uh, pull request to um, to insert any malicious code. Um, and so it's telling the maintainer, oh, it should be safe to approve and run uh, the workflows that need maintainer approval. So I'm going to switch over to my other um, my other uh, tab, my other window, in which I'm working on this lesson. And um, I'm going to approve uh, I'm going to approve this um, this workflow and run it. And what's happening here is that um, on the back end, uh, Workbench is going to be, uh, and this uh, this kind of step where the maintainer has to click approve and run, um, this only happens for new contributors, for people who uh, contribute for the very first time. If they've had their changes merged, then the workflows will automatically run. Um, and what's going to happen is, um, it's going to uh, receive the pull request. It's going to build the markdown source file. Um, and it's going to um, uh, set up the lesson, set up R, set up the packages needed to build the, to rebuild the lesson. Um, and it's going to uh, render the markdown document and then create a, um, it's going to create a, a new branch that's temporary in which you can view the changes. And I'm going to, I have some examples here in other pull requests while we wait for this to run um, that I can show you. So um, here is my previous um, attempt. I had, you can see that I changed the files, uh, just the pyramid example here, um, did the same changes. Um, and I also changed the title uh, from uh, sky to burning sky sunny sky to smoky sky and the shady sky to smokier sky. Um, so, uh, and one of the things that you can actually see is that um, GitHub is helpfully saying, hey, we have, there are some files that you did not change that have some annotations from the check. And here that um, this block quote is an unknown uh, fence div. Um, and then here, uh, like this link actually needs HTTPS um, as an unknown div warrant. Um, so those are things that the maintainers would want to change. But if I, um, you remember that I had in my pull request, uh, which is over here, um, oh, darn it. <laughs> um, in my original pull request, uh, there was a confirmation message that said, hey, thank you for contributing. And I'm going to show you the differences between that. Um, said pre-flight checks passed. 
But then after the check, after the uh, additional workflows are run, after the, the uh, markdown was built, it updated its comments. And it says, hey, um, you created a pull request, thanks. Um, and this is an automated check. Uh, you want to make sure to check for the output uh, is correct, the figures are correct. If, uh, if there are any new warnings or new errors that pop up, um, and it gives me a link to inspect the changes. So I'm going to go ahead and open that in a new tab. Um, and it gives me a summary of what's changed. Um, there are a couple of things that I need to, there are a couple of things that uh, you shouldn't be distracted by. Don't be distracted by this config.yaml. Don't be distracted by this rams.lock. These are things that I need to work on. Um, but I see that pyramid example changed, which is what I expected. And then fig six pyramid example rendered uh, pyramid one, that PNG has been changed, uh, which is what I was hoping. And so let me take a look at the comparison. And um, what I see is that, okay, so this, this is what I changed and that's good. But also now um, the, the rendered example has changed uh, to reflect my, to reflect my changes. And I can see what I meant uh, actually came out and what I saw, what we see. And it's important that we have these specific points of rendering um, because um, it allows me to, it allows me to see exactly what changed. So for example, if an error pops up, then I know an error pops up and I don't have to scroll through the entire website to find exactly where I changed things. And so what I want you to do uh, right now is I want you to, um, go to the pull request workflow example and i want you to try this out um, so go to the pull request workflow example and try editing the colors on this pyramid um, and we have some we have a challenge here for you and there is a resource uh, here that's available that can give you um, uh, the color names and values in r um, so that you can try changing the color of the pyramid. And as we go through that, as you go through that, I'll go ahead and approve your pull request. And um, when they get, when they're done, um, you'll be able to see the messages that uh, your changes have been rendered. Um, and indeed, uh, you can see that um, here we have uh, my more, my more recent, um, my, my pull request that I created as we were talking uh, has successfully rendered and um, shown me the changes. Uh, so go ahead and um, try this out. Um, and uh, let me know if you have any questions.
And as I'm seeing these pull requests come in, uh, thank thank you for uh, for working with these and creating these uh, uh, these different colors. Um, I'm really excited to see what they uh, how they turn out. Um, uh, this so this process. Um, one of the reasons why this is uh, we do cache things as we're going along, uh, but sometimes it does take a little bit to uh, warm up. It usually takes about two or three minutes for um, for a pull request preview to um, uh, to report back. Um, But once it does, uh, then you can come uh, come back, um, and uh, you'll be able to see the changes in your in your pyramid. Um, and it is currently 8:50, oh, 8:50 on the Pacific coast um, of the U.S. Yeah, um, and uh, I think we are. This is this is nearing the end of the time. So um, if any. I will continue to approve these pull requests as they come through, um, and you can um, uh, use that as a use that as a starting point. And what I encourage you all to do, uh, if you if you are interested in the workbench, um, or if you're interested in learning more, um, again, you can uh, visit the workbench homepage, um, which will give you um, which will give you information about the workbench. Um, and you can uh, try out the template. Um, I can show you exactly what um, you can try out the template. You can um, you can read through the official workbench documentation, um, in which that gives you setup instructions um, for building the workbench. Um, and uh, as we indicated, building the workbench, um, it you uh, you can work directly on GitHub, or um, you can use R as well, um, and you can use it anywhere. You can you can use R, which means that on your own computer, on your friend's computer, or even on R Studio Cloud, um, you can use that to build Workbench. Um, and um, and I hope that uh, this has been informative. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, because I'm uh, always I'm always working on the workbench um, and will be uh, uh, to address the question about the um, about the beta phase. Um, the beta phase is going to be um, there is a translation uh, script that or there is a translation um, process that I have um, that actually uses pegboard in the back end to parse the markdown. Uh, from the former Jekyll template, um, and and then um, rework them to the uh, to be um, in the more common Pandoc format, um, and then re rearranges the folders and um, cleans out some of the styles uh, commits that, uh, and also um, um, it cleans out the styles commits and also the um, Generated content uh, that has been that has been inserted over the years, um, and uh, we're always learning. So please ask any questions you want, um, and I will do my best to answer them. Um, and I think uh, with that, um, I don't know what to. I'm I'm never good at ending things. I apologize, but I'd be happy to take any questions. Susan, you've unmuted, so that I. Um... Yeah, I was gonna. I was th gonna thank you. It was wonderful. It's great. I know it's very hard to do um, live like that. I had a question because it seems like GitHub keeps on moving how they're doing these things, but um, I don't think you need to fork before you do make the change. That is, if you propose to edit, if you ask to edit, I think that GitHub automatically forks for you. And then proposes the PR. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Okay, okay. So. Okay. I just I just wanted to check. That's good. Okay. Yeah. No. That's a good question. And um, Sarah Stevens and I had a workshop on or a, a skill up on working on GitHub directly on Wednesday, and we covered that exact thing. Um, right. 
Uh, so yeah, it's um, GitHub does uh, make things a bit easier in that manner. Um, now, right. Okay. Thanks. And for those of you who are wondering about the workbench, uh, like what do you need to update in the workbench? There is one thing that does need to be up. So um, for those of you who are working on lessons uh, on the workbench, um, the workflows will need to be updated from time to time. However, um, on official Carpentries repositories, that will come in as an official pull request um, uh, from the Carpentries bot. Um, and um, I saw, I sorry, I, I just saw a bunch of a bunch of pull requests come in that I need to approve. Um, that will come in uh, from an official carpentry bot. Um, and let me go ahead and show you what one looks like. Um, it will come in and. Um, and uh, it will come in every week. Um, and it will uh, update the workflows. If you if you see it coming in from an account that's not the bot, uh, you can close it. Um, but also, if you're working on lessons in R, um, the the package case the the package the packages are cached, and you can up and they can be updated monthly um, or at any time uh, that you want. So, for example, um, here is um, an example of a Oh, this was my pull request. Here we are. Um, this is an example of an automated uh, pull request that updates the R packages and gives you the same kind of output that shows you what has changed um, in the lesson due to these updates. Um, and so I had there were questions about um, uh, there was another question from Benson. Will you add accessibility testing? Yes, we are working on that. Um, it does take it. It's one of those things that uh, automated accessibility testing in this context is slightly out of my skill set, but it's one thing that I am working towards. Um, we have we have that on our roadmap. Um, uh, but yeah, that's uh, one of the one of the benefits of having the uh, one of the benefits of having the var having the varnish repository is that we developed this. Um, the, the styling was developed uh, in a way that did have testing um, for the template itself. So um, we know that the, all of the elements of the, in, of the template are accessible um, and it does pass um, contrast uh, specifications. Um, yeah, and uh, it's, uh, things will be much easier to implement accessibly. But thank you for that question. Uh, no, Brenda's happy about that. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't do not know, um, uh, Brynn is our accessibility coordinator. Um, so she's uh, and she, I'm going to be working with her to make sure that um, uh, we have we make sure that our lessons are accessible and not just picking all the boxes. Um, and we have about two minutes left. I'm going to keep approving these. Um, I'm going to keep approving these pull requests so that you can see the um, the results of them. Um, but with that, we have. I want to thank you all for being here. Um, and if Toby has any um, final words, um, uh, Jean, before you wrap up, there was one question yeah. in the chat. Oh, I did not see it. Okay. Um, where do you do the rendered pie chart in the GitHub browser? Yes. Uh, let me show you. Um, do, 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 do. That's not two. One minute left. <laughs> okay. Um, let's go to the chocolate um, color uh, pull request. So in the in the pull request pre in the co pull request comment, um, GitHub Actions bot will say thank you, um, and it will give you a uh, a link to inspect the changes. Uh, so you can click on this link. Um, and it will open up the GitHub browser for you. Um, and when you scroll down, you can see the different, the, the changed um, output. Does that help? Excellent. 
Okay. Um, so with that, um, I will officially say thank you, um, and uh, we can stop the recording. Um, and uh, Toby, ha Toby has his uh,